Um, so, hey everyone. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Katrina. I'm a software engineer here at Union, a contributor to Flight Open Source. And today we'll be taking kind of a peek at what happens to the Flight workflow after you kind of finish writing it um, and want to execute it on Flight. Um, just so as an overview, we'll go over, you know, writing a flight workflow, registering a flight workflow, what exactly does that mean? And then kind of different models for executing a flight workflow um, for different task type examples. Um, so writing a flight workflow, hopefully you're all familiar with what <laughs> flight workflow syntax looks like. Um, here's a really basic example we're using to kind of like walk through. Um, so you have the square workflow, which squares an input value. Um, and you're probably familiar, you know, writing workflow tasks, uh, workflows, running those locally, uh, testing those locally. Um, but after you're kind of like, you know, convinced that your code works, um, you go through the registration process. And what exactly happens there? Well, let's take a look. Um, so before we into like what happens when you register a flight workflow, let's talk about a little why we register. Um, registering a workflow gives us, uh, allows us to do a compilation pass, which ensures uh, which is this kind of more like static validation to ensure that your work workflow won't fail at execution time, allows us to version a workflow, creates um, a, an artifact that we can store in our database that's shareable, reusable, um, you can distribute with your team. And it also gives us a concrete um, executable definition of flight workflow that allows us to visualize it um, you know, as a DAG where you can see how data dependencies kind of inform your, your node edges and define your workflow structure. And as part of registering a flight workflow, you know, first you write and you test your Python code like we discussed earlier. Then you'll use flight kit serialize, which you may have seen before as part of the registration process, which takes your kind of your Python user facing code and converts it into a protobuf, um, which is a wire format um, and allows you to kind of have a serializable representation of the, the workflow definition. Um, and as part of the registration process, you might also go ahead and build and push container images. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it can be sometimes a slow process, but it allows us to essentially capture the runtime environment that's used to run your uh, Python code definitions and your Python tasks. After you serialize, we'll go ahead and we'll compile that, pro that uh, workflow protobuf representation, do that static analysis and validation, and then that produces an executable artifact that will persist in the database and which ends up being used when you execute a workflow or you do share that workflow definition or pull it perhaps say in flight kit remote. So let's take a look at what those individual steps uh, define or in, in, entail. Um, so in this case, flight kit serialize, uh, we talked a little bit about how it takes that, you know, that original square uh, task definition that's used in that uh, workflow definition um, and converts it into this kind of serialable proto uh, protobuf representation we see here. This has just been dumped to JSON uh, just for uh, ease of visualization. These uh, representations are portable. You'll notice here that we don't actually have a project or domain filled in. Um, that all gets substituted at registration time, but the core definition of the workflow is captured in this representation. After serialization, we'll go ahead and register that workflow. We'll upload that to Flight Admin through an API call. Flight Admin will take that kind of precursor workflow definition, go ahead and compile it, uh, which is where we do that analysis, figure out if there's any exceptions or invalid workflow components. Um, and then if that compilation step succeeds, uh, then we'll go ahead and produce an executable uh, artifact, uh, which is you know that, that definition that you'll see when you later flight CTL get it, or you know say uh, you know visualize it in the UI, for example. That's that kind of compiled finalized workflow definition. It's saved in the database, it's versioned, it's immutable, although you can always create new versions, um, and it's kind of the reference workflow entity um, after you've uh, completed the registration process. Um, and here's uh, Niels's uh, weather forecasting example for a more fun, complicated example of workflow. So after you registered, uh, persisted that workflow definition, you go ahead and call execute. Well, what happens there? So what we do is we take the, the compilation artifact, we uh, translate that into Kubernetes CRD. Um, if you're interested, Kubernetes, uh, it's a CRD's custom resource definition. It's Kubernetes extensions, what we essentially use to store workflow state during the, uh, the duration of the workflow execution allows us to capture individual node statuses and the overall workflow status. As far as actually executing the workflow, well, so we have a DAG that's defined by these kind of data dependencies between nodes, right? And that kind of informs, you know, how we can progress in our workflow execution. And that we use that in order to um, traverse uh, the nodes in the workflow and figure out what we can begin executing now. 
this comes with you know a few benefits, which allows us to kind of you know auto parallelize that execution. When any node has its input dependencies met, we can immediately begin execution. We don't have to do this serially, one node at a time. Um, and additional performance benefits come from saying you know using discovery caching. Um, when you run the same node with the same set of inputs for the same version, we can just go ahead and fetch that pre-computed result without you necessarily having to redo that com expensive computation. And Propeller is the component that, again, is responsible for kind of, you know, traversing the workflow DAG, reporting on uh, no changes as they occur. Um, it takes a look as, uh, you know, your individual tasks complete. It will report on outputs, face changes, and errors as they do arise. So you can visualize all this in the UI and get real-time feedback on the status of your workflow execution. So let's revisit our kind of square example. A little simple, but it should be sufficient to get us to walk through what happens, you know, say, for a Python task. Um, so in this case, um, what we do is as we're you know, progressing through that square uh, task, uh, Flight Propeller will create a Kubernetes pod that uh, runs that user code uh, that you'd find in the square task definition inside of a container that it brings up. And that container is the one that we pre-built at serialization slash reg registration time. Um, so Flight Propeller will keep periodically monitoring the status of that pod and reports as it progresses and changes phase after it produces um, an output Flight Propeller will send all that data back to Flight Admin um, and uh, capture that so that it can run any downstream nodes that consume the outputs of that square test um, as their inputs. So let's take a look at, say, another example of tasks, which is uh, you know, a SQL query uh, example, but this could be any kind of like remote service example. And you see here that the structure of the, the task execution changes a little bit. In this case, we don't actually necessarily need to bring up a pod within Kubernetes. We just make an external service call, which allows us to kind of eliminate that, you know, container runtime overhead of bringing up the pod in the container. Um, in this case, Flight Propeller is simply just calling out to that external service, executing that query that got captured at serialization time. And again, you know, checking in with that, whatever remote service might be um, and uh, pulling to uh, get outputs or uh, an exception if it does occur. And again, feed that all back to flight admin, uh, persist that in the control plane, and have um, a finite uh, or have a, a final set of uh, events. And then let's take a look at one more example. This one's a little more fun. Um, what happens with a, a dynamic workflow? So in this case, we kind of see how you know this registration or how like the workflow uh, serialization registration process comes into play uh, at execution time. So when you run, when you have a dynamic node, uh, Flight Propeller will again kind of spin up a Kubernetes pod that'll run your user code in a container. In this case, what the user code does is it produces a brand new workflow spec. Um, and just like the process for you know running through a workflow, traversing the nodes within the DAG, Flight Propeller will repeat this for the workflow that's uh, produced in the dynamic node. Uh, proceed through the execution of that newly generated workflow, and once that succeeds, essentially mark that you know enclosing parent node as uh, completed. And you know, through the process of you know uh, monitoring the dynamic node execution, again, Flight Propeller will uh, report on execution events, uh, send back output details, and all this will persist in the database so that you can go ahead and uh, use this um, to you know visualize and also um, see individual inputs and outputs later on. Once that node completes, um, then Flight Propeller continues to traversing the nodes within the DAG, and um, yeah, there you go. That is workflow execution. Um, so that's all for just this kind of quick lightning talk. Um, but if you have any questions, happy to help answer. Um, and a few more resources if you're interested in kind of learning more about how data flow kind of works between tasks or understanding the kind of broader workflow state machine that um, Flight Propeller operates on. Yep. Thanks so much. That's great. I think uh, if people don't have questions, I want to add one thing to it is. Uh, when we are running the SQL task that Katrina talked about, that's called a backend plugin. So if you have, uh, and those can be extended for yourself, uh, you can essentially invoke any service and make state changes in that other service outside of Kubernetes. And I think one of the goals of Flight was to connect Kubernetes with the outside world uh, in a very, very simple way and, and keep the user experience the same. So um, <clears throat> there are already a bunch of, uh, connections or backend plugins available. Uh, but as you, if you guys would want, please, uh, the docs on it. If not, you want to ping us, uh, let us know. We can help you write one. I know there's somebody working on a task plugin. There's a Flink plugin. 
that's in progress that are, but these are Kubernetes specific plugins. So that allow you to orchestrate the more complicated stuff on Kubernetes, but also there is, I think BigQuery, Snowflake, Redshift exists, uh, Athena exists, but Redshift is in progress or something. And uh, so yeah, so if you have ideas, let us know.